to welcome to the very first installment of this Chevelle painting. So what I'm going to do on this uh, series is do half hour videos uh, of the entire process of this painting. Uh, this isn't a painting specifically for someone, but it kind of came at the request of someone. Uh, so um, I thought it'd be a great way to kind of show the complete like a beginning to ending uh, of one of these paintings, but uh, be able to break it up so that you don't have to necessarily sit through hour, hours and hours of um, one video. Um, so what I do is I started with um, a aluminum panel, and these are powder coated aluminum panels. So these are 063, so they're, they're, they're real rigid. They hold up really well. Uh, they're powder coated, so you could just, you know, scuff them, prime them, and they're ready to go. So that's exactly what I do. They have this protective sheet on them. So I peel that off and then you have the, the surface ready to go. Uh, I sanded this and then I sprayed this with auto born sealer from Createx. Uh, this is, um, it's just a great, great primer sealer coat. Uh, works really well. Um, it's sandable. It, it basically does everything I want. So I mixed up a, a gray from the Autoborn Sealer uh, white and dark or black and I came up with a, a good primerish gray color. I just wanted a gray ground on this. I could have done it just in white or I could have done it in black too. But uh, these, I really like having the gray because it acts as like a mid-tone for the painting. Uh, so I can leave some of the showing essentially, which is nice. Um, it's a little bit darker than I probably would want, but um, could certainly make it work. Okay, so once that's sprayed and um, it's given it plenty of time to cure, I can actually go in and sand this. And that's exactly what I did. I hit it with 800 and then I hit it with a little uh, Scotch-Brite pad, um, which is actually the same grid as 800 too. It's not made by scotch bright but it's a uh, same kind of similar product it's it's this uh gray fibery pad and this is the equivalent of 800 paper so i just hit the whole thing really lightly to make sure everything's smooth and ready to go and here we are all right so what i didn't do first to show you guys um but um i took my reference photo of this uh malibu ss uh che chevelle 67 and uh, and I cropped it, I turned it, composed it, and uh, got it all ready to go. So this is outside square is the same size as this panel, which is five by seven. And uh, and I've kind of got everything ready, changed the um, the the um, the contrast of it a little bit just to bring out certain parts. I'm going to eliminate the entire background. When this is done, it'll look like it's kind of sitting in a showroom. Uh, I'm going to lessen this the shadow. So all that stuff kind of happens after after the fact. It's nice because I can be sent a photograph of a car that maybe not be the best photograph, uh, but I can do a lot of the changes that will uh, they'll make it really into a kind of a nice painting. I love tilting. I'm going to hold this straight so you guys can see it. I love tilting the car in in the in the image um, it just gives it a sense of movement without having the car even moving um, if it's very flat if it's very even and straight across it gives it a very still uh, again showroom type type look in the painting so i like to give it a little tilt uh, either clockwise or counterclockwise depending on how the how the composition goes and that just really opens it up well uh, so that's where we're at with this um, i've left a little bit of extra space on the outside edges just in case this painting is framed in a normal frame, which will cut off some of the edge here. It'll actually sit underneath the frame. Um, but I didn't cut off enough that um, if someone wanted to float this, essentially mount this in a frame where you can see the entire edge, that there isn't too much of that extra space around the outside edge. I can also throw a pinstripe in around the edge. That'll help too. Uh, so those are all things that'll, that'll come as, as, as we go. All right, so first thing I do with these is the background. So I'm gonna actually cut out this car and I'm going to use this as the, the mask for this um, for this painting. So I'm going to put this aside for a second so it doesn't get anything on it. Oh, essentially, I should have mentioned that too. My uh, workbench has a piece of craft paper on it, but underneath this is a piece of powder-coated steel. Uh, so that's really nice in that um, all, all kinds of magnets will stick to it. So I can use these to hold different things like the paintings. In this case, I have a, I just taped a piece of sheet magnet on the back of this aluminum panel. And so now I can just uh, drop this panel in on the board and no matter where I put it, it'll stay exactly where I want. So it's really kind of a neat thing. Uh, in case you're wondering how that's magically staying where it's, where I put it. All right, let's get to it. 
If you have any questions along the way, feel free to drop them in the comments. This is a little bit different than the live feed, or it's a lot different than the live feed that I normally do in that um, you know, there isn't that live interaction. But the nice thing about it is, as you'll see, if you, if you go on the live feeds, either Instagram or Facebook, um, I tend to do a lot more interacting and talking because there's a lot to do. I mean, we give away paintings and things like that. But still, there's a lot more interacting and that slows things down. These videos here on YouTube will just be uh, just raw painting. But again, if you have a question, drop it in the comments and I'll be happy to get back to you. All right. So I'm going to cut out the car first. Uh, I'll get you closer where you need it. But I think at this point, you know, if you guys are out there, that's probably good because you'll kind of see everything. And um, I'll explain things as they go, too. So when cutting this, this is a little bit bigger than the uh, little three inch by four inch paintings that I do. Um, but I use a lot of the same kind of techniques, especially for cutting. Uh, simple, like simple things you wouldn't even think of but make a huge difference. Like when you're cutting, when you're cutting on an object, to cut on the outside of the object, on the outside of the line, it makes a big difference, especially when you're doing really small cuts in small areas. You wouldn't even think that. It seems like it's common sense, but when we cut something out, we, I don't know for about everyone, but I tend to want to cut subconsciously. I want to just cut on that edge instead of outside that edge. So I'd be cutting right on the line instead of outside, like along the edge. And it's just one of those things that makes a difference if you're working on a real small scale. Uh, if you start, if you bring everything in a little bit, then you have to compensate for that when you're painting it in. So little things like that. I'm using a, just a regular number 11 X-Acto blade. Um, there are so many different blades out there, so many different shapes and styles. It's really just, you know, kind of boiling it down to the blade that you like the best. Um, I love the number, number 11s. I've just been using them forever and, um, and they're easy to find, you know, you can get them just about anywhere. Um, so, so that's nice too. If I'm never really, you know, having to scramble to try to find them when I run out. I have used some of the generic blades, but I keep coming back to Exacto because some of those generic blades are really, really terrible. Some are, I have found a few off brands that are good, but um, for the amount of cutting that I do, um, it's just not worth kind of messing around with that aspect of it. It's better to just pay a little bit more, get the blades I know that are going to work, and um, set. So I'm concentrating on the background. So I'm cutting out just, you know, just the car. Everything where, like, you saw me do the, the windscreen, the windscreen, the windshield. So obviously it's a convertible so you can see through it. So I wanted to get that out of there for the background. The background is going to be kind of a gray fade. Um, and it's something I do a lot on the smaller paintings, the three by fours, just to kind of give them some interest. But what I wanted to do with this painting, since it's a little bit bigger at five by seven, uh, I do a lot of these car portraits. Usually they're even bigger than this, about 8 by 10 But they're generally all color, too, with the bigger ones. People, you know, commission me to do their, a painting of their car, but it's, um, you know, it's a little bit bigger. It's 8 by 10 and it's color, and, you know, it works out really well. But with this one, since this is really for myself or, you know, for someone who may want it down the road, uh, I thought it'd be fun to do one of these essentially a 543, these small black and white paintings, but just scale it up a little bit and put a little bit more into it. Those quick paintings, those uh, 534s are really like paint sketches for me. I uh, try to get them done fairly quickly so that I can offer them at a lower price than the more involved paintings. So, uh, so they're all black and white. They're all, you know, pretty much, um, as fast as I can do them kind of thing. I mean, they have a lot of quality to them, but uh but they're still designed to be done fast so uh so this one would be fun it's going to be kind of a crossover between the two styles the more the more finished painting and then the the quicker 543s okay so the the wheels down in here that are buried in the shadow um, i'm cutting them out 
I'm more guessing where they are than anything. They don't have to be perfect because I'm going to do the same kind of thing here. I'm going to put a, a, a you know, a, a, a darker shadow under the card. It'll fade out a little bit. Um, I won't have as, I don't think I'll have as tight of a shadow as, as what's going on here because this car is in direct sunlight. Uh, but I can blur out the wheels a little bit. So, because uh, I think when I pull this, you're going to see this wheel is probably not cut quite right. It should probably need to be a little bit more round. But in the end, it won't matter because again, that'll be kind of buried in the shadow. So, just run right around the whole outside edge. And there we go, that's it. So now it's it's cut out, but it's still got a couple little little tabs holding it in place, which is good because I've took taken the time to compose this and tilt it and all that. So I wanna translate that to the panel. So I'm gonna leave that in and use this to line everything up. Grab the panel again. I need the reference. Okay, so here's our panel. Now again, there's a magnet on the back. This this bench is steel, so magnets will actually work right through this aluminum, even though it's heavier duty. There's a lot of steel and a lot of magnets going on behind it, so it'll still work. So I just get these rare earth magnets. I'll show you one without my little handle, and I'll kind of tell you how I did that. Well, let me tack this in first, and then we'll get that. Yeah, here's one. So this is the rare earth magnet that that I've got, um, and um, what I do is I just take a a little screw, a little wood screw, I clip off the top, and then I just epoxy it onto the magnet. And that these magnets are great, but they're they're rare earth, they're neodymium magnets, so they're very strong. Um, so when when this is on the bench like that, it's difficult to get this off. You really got to kind of pick at it to get it off. So by putting the little wooden ha or the little screwed handle on it, it makes it much easier to pick these up and move them around. So, all right. So this is on. Like I said, it's 063 aluminum. This these magnets don't really hold as well through all that aluminum, but they still hold enough to do the job. I just need this not to kind of slide around when I'm when I'm painting. So I just load this guy up with the edge with these magnets. And now I can pull off the background. And I just kind of pull at it till all the tabs release that I didn't quite cut through. And now that car is just in the right spot. So at this point, I take a look at things. Even though I composed it in Photoshop and got everything kind of ready, I still stop here and take a look at it. It's obviously super easy to just move it around a little bit to get you know a different feel um, and now's a good time to do that because it's obviously difficult to change later but uh, this looks pretty good I think I'm gonna roll with this the way it is I really like the, how it's how aggressive it is as it's coming down I'll tilt this a little bit too so you can see it more straight on so it's got kind of this aggressiveness in the way that it's tilted forward but at the same time the grill is almost parallel with the uh, bottom edge which is nice too the original photo was, you know, tilted more like this, so that that corner is more up. You know, you see more of a wedge shape. So there you go. One last check before I commit to this. I think I'm gonna. I actually, I am thinking I'm gonna drop this a little bit, not much, but I do want to lessen that just a hair. So I'm gonna drop that back side down a little bit, pull it up, and drop it down until it just kind of sits in the right spot for me visually. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Put the magnets back on here. Love to be able to get a magnet up on this top edge, but um, it's not gonna happen. If I put a, a smaller magnet on here, it's not gonna hold enough, so it'll just snap over, which is not, not really what I want. So, uh, so I'm gonna leave that and just hold it down manually. I save all of these photocopies. There'll definitely be a chance for me to use this one somewhere down the road. So I wanna make sure I, I do that too. I just save it, because it essentially, you know, why cut it out twice, that kind of thing. All right, for this entire painting, I'm just gonna use uh, Wicked Opaque White and Wicked Opaque, uh, Wicked Opaque Black. And the reducer that I'll be using is uh, the uh, Createx 4011 reducer. So that's it. That's all I'll be using for this painting throughout the entire thing. Um, there is a slight chance that I'll use um, 
a little bit of a shifting color possibly but um, we'll talk about that when we get there to see if we need it okay sure everything's good we are so for the airbrush for this piece um, I think yeah let's do this I'm gonna use two airbrushes today or throughout this painting the first one is uh, just a, the regular Iwata HPC deluxe uh, this is an older brush. The new version of this brush has a lot of neat things on it. And also you'll notice the handle doesn't look like a regular HPC. This has a uh, triple action handle by Gentry Riley. And I'll put the, the link to that. And I'll put the link to the airbrushes too that I'm using and the paint as well. Uh, so that way you guys can kind of get a feel for everything that I'm using. Uh, triple action handle is really nice. I do a YouTube video on this in the Tech Tuesday, so you can check that out. And I also have a uh, Grex trigger pad for this too, which I, I've been using a lot um, on this one. Keeps things uh, comfortable. The other airbrush I'll be using throughout this painting is the Iwata Custom Micron C. So I'll also put a link to this, this brush here. Uh, and this will be this will do the most of the work, most of the heavy lifting for this painting. Uh, but I love having one brush for white and one brush for black. And this brush here, the HPC, is a little bit bigger nozzle and needle, uh, so it just really, really works well with the white. All right. So the way I usually do these paintings, um, I split the background. It goes from a light to a dark, and the way I determine which is light and which is dark is is all by the painting or all by the car. So generally these cars are lit from the top, so all the highlights are on the top side of the car and then the shadows are all underneath, which makes sense. Uh, so what I'll generally end up doing is having the, the light area on the bottom and that fades up to dark on the top. And that really helps push the, the, uh, the car. You have the really dark background against the really light highlights on the car. And on the other side of that, you have the really light ground against the really dark shadows and tires and, and that kind of thing. So. All right, so that's the theory behind it. So first thing I'm gonna start with is the white. So I pre-reduce the white. Um, this is uh, one to one. So it's one part paint to one part reducer. And that gives me a, a, a really thin, thin but, but still covering white. I'm gonna start on the bottom and work up. Actually, what I'm gonna do, I'll tilt this upside down. So it's a little bit easier to go with the um, the edge of the template this way, the, the cutout. If I go the other way, if I were to spray the white up here, it would, by having the airbrush at this angle, it would get underneath that template and push it up. This way I'm spraying off the template and keeping everything pushed down. Just really light control layers, just over and over again. I'm gonna actually angle it so it'll, it'll roll with the car. But before I do that, actually, before I do that, I'm gonna take a quick look at something. So my initial thought was to have the angle of the fade be strongest here and move across diagonally here to the darkest. But I think I'm gonna change that. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the lightest light here and angle it this way. That will give this composition, this seemingly simple composition with the car, it'll give it an X, essentially. The, the horizon line will be going this way, um, and then the car will be kind of coming in this way. That'll give that really, you know, kind of a nice X. If I go the same direction, it might give it too much of a, um, and it just might be too much in one direction. So I think that's what we'll do. All right, but I had to flip it upside, right side up so I could see that before I made that decision. All right. So now that I've got the bottom in, which is gonna be white anyway, I'm gonna start working on that fade. So essentially angling this whole fade. I think what I also might do, instead of having it go straight across like this, I think I'm gonna scoop this fade so that it's more like this. This will give it even a little bit more. It's neat when you have simple elements, but these, these these little adjustments will really kind of help out, kind of, you know, giving it a little bit more interest when really there's there's not much there. So in that case, I'm just gonna start cupping this fade by adding more, more paint over this way. And I don't want that coming up, so I'll just move the magnet a little bit. I 
And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna bleed this white up farther than it needs to because the black on the other side of that, I want that to cover the white. I don't want the white, I don't want to be a division between the white and the black and the fade. I really want the black on the white. And the reason why I do the white first is because if I do the black first and then spray the white, the white on top of the black will shift to a blue. It'll have a weird kind of a bluish cast and I don't want to, I don't want to have to deal with that. So just layer on layer on layer and each layer I kind of push out a little bit farther. And that's how you get that really smooth transition. You can't, it's so difficult to just spray the final white and then just fade it as you go. It'll look real streaky. So by going light layer over light layer and pushing each layer out, you get a really smooth transition in that fade. Uh, don't forget there's gonna be a really dark shadow under this car too. Excellent, good. So I'm gonna leave the white in this brush because I'm gonna use, I'm gonna continuously use white in that brush. Uh, so this way I can just keep uh, keep one brush going with it. And like I said, that that bigger HPC, and I say bigger, it's still a really you know detailed brush, oriented brush with a 0.3 millimeter needle. It just really processes that heavy white paint nicely. So I can get some really tight detail with it, but it's still thick paint friendly, if you will. So that's, that makes it nice. All right, so we switch out to the Micron now, and I'm gonna do the same thing with the black. Start fading it up here, and then scooping it in as it comes down. And it's exactly the same setup, you know, the same way to do it. For the black, instead of going with the, like, the white is one to one, this opaque black is mixed one to five, so it's one part paint to five parts reducer. So this is a little bit weaker setup, than the white was, but uh, the black covers very, very well. So by having it really thin, I'll be able to get a lot of control over this. If I go with a thicker black, it may turn kind of grainy, uh, and I don't want that. I really want a smooth transition. So these these are uh, these um, reduction ratios that I use are way over the the uh, recommended um, amount of reducer that they that they recommend for their paints. Um, but the way I layer them lightly and then seal them in as I go, I've really had great luck with uh, kind of uh, getting around the um, recommended uh, reduction ratios, which is only about 10%. They spray great, but um, I like to push things. <laughs> All right, so this is the black. It's the same thing. So I start on the top edge where it's darkest and just go light layers over and over again. Again, it'd be so easy to just grab the straight black, put it in a big fat brush, and just go for it. But um, you get such such an even, smooth transition by putting it on in real light layers and kind of being patient with it. Okay, so now as I get lower on this and I start moving into the white, I just kind of keep in mind that I want that kind of cupped feel in that in that fade. I'm also really keeping an eye on um, any random, like sometimes, like I should have strained this paint before I started spraying it. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on this to see if any random little chunks pop out uh, since I didn't strain it. Um, if it does right now, if it spits out a little chunk of paint, <coughs> excuse me, it's really easy to get that little thing off and then fix it. Um, so, so I'm keeping an eye out as I'm going too. But so far, I just mixed this black up, so um, so there's I, I know there's not a whole lot in it. Well, what what happens is, and you can watch again if you if you're into it and follow my YouTube channel. Um, I talk about straining the paint in one of the Tech Tuesdays, and it explains you know a lot about why that's important. These are old. I mean, I've used these bottles a lot, and the paint dries up in in the top of the cap, and that dry paint flakes off and ends up in the bottle. And uh, so, no matter how clean it was when you put it in. Uh, you can always get these little dry chunks of paint. <coughs> Excuse me. Frog in my throat. 
All right. And then as I'm getting to the fade, I'm actually I'm actually putting even a lighter layer of black on. So out here, I'm kind of hitting it. Not quite all the way open, maybe three quarters of the way open for the trigger. So there's a lot of paint coming out there. It's still really thin, so I have a lot of control of, over it. And I'm making sure I don't hit one area too hard, meaning make it wet and then, you know, puddle or spider. Um, but when I get out to the fade, like when I start to get to the spot where the fade is, um, I, I'm actually only pulling it back about 25 percent of the way maybe like a quarter of the way uh, so that gives me a little bit more control over this you know the, the transition between the fade just gives me a nice um, and you know a nice transition there all right one more shot and I think we're pretty close to getting this where it needs to be just kind of checking the whole thing making sure everything's nice and even Yep, that's good. Okay, good, good, good. So I'm going to carefully take these magnets off now. Uh, and I say carefully because if I were to drag this, one of these sharp, not sharp, but these metal magnets across the fade, there's a, there's a decent chance that I can scratch that. So we're going to take care of that too. So there it is. That's, that's my fade so far. There's no, obviously no shadow or anything, but uh, it's a really nice, just, just all around fade. Okay, so what I'm going to do real quick <clears throat> is I have, just grabbing the bottle for you here, yeah, is uh, 4052 UVLS Matte Clear. And I mix this also up in a already reduced um, formula of one to one. So it's, it's one part matte, one part 40, uh, 4011 reducer. So this is kind of my intercode. This will protect that fade when I go on to the next step. So I'll show you how I do that. Oops, sorry about that. <clears throat> For this, actually I should have mentioned this because it's one more brush that I'm gonna be using in this painting. <clears throat> this is the uh, Grex Tritium. And this is set up with a 0.7 millimeter fan cap on it, which is really nice. It's a big, big opening for an airbrush, small opening for a spray gun. But this is a fixed double action brush. So if you pull it back, you get air and then you get paint the rest of the way. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to use this to put a really light layer of matte clear over this whole painting. And what this will do is it'll protect that fade for me in case I accidentally, you know, drop something on it or, you know, accidentally come close to scratching it. It'll also protect the outside edge of this painting as I'm handling it. Um, I won't knock any of the paint off, which is nice. So, again, it's already pre-mixed. It's one-to-one, -one, so it makes it really easy. Again, this is over-reduced for what this product is designed to do. But for this application, since I'm just looking to seal this in really lightly... <clears throat> And just nice, even coats with 50% overlap. Ran out, so I'll hit this again. Now I'm just going to keep the air moving across it. I'll just move this back pretty far. Just keep the air moving across that to uh, let that cure out. There we go. Good. And that is the background, ready to go. Um, now, we, I was talking a little bit about maybe putting a pinstripe in on this. You know, it'll go right around the outside edge, which is very possible looking at this now. Uh, but that can happen later. That doesn't have to happen yet. That doesn't interfere, interfere with the car at all. But now as this cures, I'll give it, you know, about 10 minutes to really set up. Um, now this will be protected, so I don't have to worry about, you know, getting, a, getting something on it, banging it or, or whatever. Uh, so that's, that's going to work out really, really well. 
Uh, so there you go. All right, so that's our first installment. So come back uh, for the next one, and I'm going to start digging into the car. And again, I'm going to show this entire painting throughout the whole way. Uh, there won't be any parts that won't be on, on these videos, so you'll be able to watch them one after another and get the entire video. So I'm Steve Leahy. If you like this, please like and subscribe, and uh, hit that bell icon too, and share it with everyone you know. And uh, yeah, we'll get this painting done. So thanks very much, guys, and I will catch you on the next one.